Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. We started a series several weeks ago that we've entitled, Jesus Said the Darndest Things. Now, really what we've tried to do in this course is to look at some of the more difficult things the Lord said, and then just go ahead and dig into it and, you know, explore it and just see what we can get out of it. Well, today we're going to be looking at a couple of instances, and really this is really a hot potato. It really is. But we're going to look at a couple of instances where Jesus seemed, what, how, do, how should I say this, harsh, unkind, if I dare say it, maybe even just a little bit mean. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, and hopefully your first response was, well, well Pastor Ron, Jesus is never mean. And I agree with you. If you said that, you'd be right. But there are some instances where he does seem to be just a little edgy. So we want to go ahead and look at those. We're going to dig into those. But before we do, I just want to give you the same advice that my Bible college dean gave me years ago. And he said this. He said, whenever you're reading the Bible and you see either one of the difficult passages or something that looks where God's, you know, maybe acting out of character, whenever you see something like that, always stay on God's side. All right? Now, as we go through this this morning, again, there's some things that Jesus is going to look, it's going to look, you know, a little edgy. But again, always stay on his side. And then just assume there's a revelation in there somewhere. Now, stay on his side. Go ahead and dig. And I said to you, you'll get a revelation. And when you do, God's going to show you something great. Now, we're really going to look at two stories today. The main story we're going to look at is the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Now, does anybody remember her? Maybe you don't recognize, you know, the term Syrophoenician woman. This is the lady that came to Jesus for help for her daughter. And you remember Jesus called her what? A dog, right? He called her a dog. Now, some of the newer translations I've noticed, I've read this in several translations digging into it, and some of the newer translations try to soften it a little bit. You know, instead of saying, well, you know, he called her a dog. Well, he didn't really call her a dog. He called her a little dog, Right? Now, I'm not sure how much that softened it, you know? It's kind of like going up to your wife and saying, honey, I think you're getting a little bit fat. The little, the word little didn't save you. All right, trust me on this. No, I haven't done that. And, uh, but, but there, you know, just for, for illustration there. No, he, he, like it or not, he called her a dog. So we're going to dig into this. Uh, and, you know, again, it's, it's a little bit harsh, but really in my mind, that story with the Syrophoenician woman is the second harshest that we could look at. So we're going to skip it. We're going to put that on hold for just a moment. We're going to look at what I consider to be the harshest that Jesus was, if, if we could call it harsh. We're going to go ahead and look at a passage over in Luke 9. Now, there's only a couple of verses here. I'll give you the reference. You don't have to turn to it. You're already holding a couple of spots. But Luke 9, 57 said this. Now, why are we looking at this one, what I consider to be the harshest one? Because I want you to see that there's always a revelation in there somewhere. And again, if you can find the revelation, again, it, it just softens it right up. But Luke 9, 57, Jesus has been calling people to follow him. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, I'll let the dead bury the dead. You go preach. You go preach the kingdom of God. Now, any way you cut that, any way you look at it, you've got to admit that's a little tough, Right? I mean, the fellow wants to go to his father's funeral. I mean, it looks a little tough. And, you know, I've found, you know, the atheist websites have had a field day with this. They really have. Now, I don't suggest you go to atheist websites. If maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Hope you don't. I do. And I kind of do it on purpose. I just kind of like to get in the chat rooms and argue and try to get people saved. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, but you know, I've been there a few times. And I've been amazed that even when you're talking about something completely unrelated, they'll bring up that story and they'll say, what kind of a God you, do you serve anyhow? Wouldn't even let this guy go to his daddy's funeral. Seems harsh. You want me to help you out? I'll give you the key to the story. The, the fellow's dad wasn't dead. Now, I, I got a book here, and, and I'm going to give you the title. This would really help you. It's bailed me out a few times. It's called, it's called Strange Scriptures That Perplex the Western Mind. It's really good at digging into the Jewish culture and how the Jews would have said certain things. And what they brought out here is chances are very, very good because of the way he said this, the guy's dad wasn't dead yet. 
Now, we haven't imagined it that way. When we've read the story, we've kind of pictured the dad in the morgue, and, you know, they're either embalming him, and, and you know, the guy's in, in, in you know, he's, he's grieving, going through the grieving process. He says, well, just, I'll follow you, Jesus. Just let me go to the funeral. And Jesus says, no. But did you notice in the story, you can go back, read it later, nowhere in the story did it say the dad had died. According to this book about Jewish culture, it said most likely that this is the way it would have come down if we put it into words that we would use. Jesus would have said to the fellow, follow me. And the fellow would have responded, I'd love to. Jesus, I'll follow you. Just let me go back to the farm and let me, you know, let my dad live out his days. You know, and in 20, 30 years when he passes away and after we've had the funeral, let me first go bury my father and then I'll come follow you. Now, if that's the case, and again, according to the Jewish culture, that's probably the case, that makes it a whole lot more understandable. Because, you know, I mean, if you said to Jesus, you know, oh, 20, 30 years, I'll come follow you. Where's Jesus going to be in 20, 30 years? At the right hand of the Father. I mean, this is a limited time offer. He's only here for three and a half years of, of active ministry. So if you say, well, you know what, I'm going to put my daddy first. Well, how many of you know that's not going to float God's boat very far either? Because again, in, in the same area, he said, whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You know, sometimes if I'm calling you to do something, you've got to leave your father and mother, right? But again, when you understand the context and understand the culture, understand some of those things, how many say well, that would soften it up a little bit? He doesn't look nearly so mean, <laughs> right? No, he's not mean at all. So what, what I wanted you to get out of that is with a little bit of digging, there's always an answer to it. Now, and when Jesus responds strangely, this will really help you, you've got to try to see his heart. Now, that being said, let's go ahead and look at the Syrophoenician woman here. Now, we're going to read this from two places. I had you open to Mark 7 and Matthew 15. Let's look at Mark 7 first. Now, this is going to be the nice account, all right? Mark 7 and verse 24. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of his da her daughter. Now, notice there it says she besought him, but we're not told what she said. We won't find that until we look at the other account. But here it just said she besought him. Could you get my daughter free? Verse 27, but Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled, for it's not made to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. So basically what he said is, you know, the, the Jews, they're the children, but you know, you dogs don't, you know, get this. He, like it or not, he called her a dog. And she answered and said unto him, yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, the devil's gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come into her house, she found the devil was gone out, and the daughter was laid upon the bed. So out of that, what do we find? We find Jesus called her a dog. Now I said that was the nice account. Let's flip over and look at Matthew's account. Matthew 15, 21. Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and she cried unto him, saying... Now remember I said we didn't see what she said before. Here's what she said. There, there came a woman of the same coast, cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Underline that phrase, it's going to be important in a bit. But she said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now watch this. Luke didn't, Mark, sorry, Mark didn't tell us this. Look at the next phrase. She said, Have mercy. My son is, sorry, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Look at this next phrase. But he answered her not a word. Now put yourself in the story. I mean, you're there and you got this desperate mama. She comes, she's crying. She's probably sobbing. She's pouring out her heart. She says, Jesus, have mercy. My daughter's vexed with the devil. Have mercy on us. Jesus looks at her and walks off. I mean, put yourself in the story. How's that for pastoral care? Now, I mean, let's make this real. Let's bring this right down to where we live. Let's suppose it's you in the story. And if one of your family members is going through it, maybe they're in the hospital or something, maybe they got a devil, maybe it's the same case, whatever it is. And you go to Pastor Dave and you say, Pastor Dave, I'm going through this. And you pour out your heart and you say, would you pray? Would you come to the hospital? Would you visit? And he looks at you and walks off. <laughs> then just to make it worse, Pastor Sheldon says, 
Pastor Dave, send her away. She's bothering me. That's exactly what they did here. If you look at the next verse, it said the disciples came and besought him and saying, send her away. She's crying after us. One translation said she's irritating us. Wow. Now there's only a couple of possibilities here. Either the atheists are right and Christians are jerks, including the one we serve, or there's a revelation in here somewhere. Now how many think there's probably a revelation in here somewhere? How many want there to be a revelation in here somewhere? All right, let me help you out. I agree with you. Jesus is not a jerk, all right? But if he's not a jerk, there must be a good reason why he responded this way. Now, why did he respond that way? I'll give you the main reason the Father told him to. Let me give you a scripture. I'll just throw this in here. You could just write down the reference. But John 12, 49 says, For I have not spoken of myself, but my Father would sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. I like that better in the Message Bible. It says, the Father who sent me gave me orders and told me what to say and how to say it. Or in this case, the Father told him what not to say and how not to say it. So you know he's under orders from the Father here. Now the disciples, I don't make any excuse for them. They probably were jerks. But Jesus had a reason. <laughs> Jesus had a reason. Now why did he respond that way? Well, if you look at verse 24, we're still there over in there in Matthew's account. If you look at verse 24, that'll give us our first clue. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, you're a Gentile, and I'm not sent to you yet. I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, here's the problem. She's trying to take advantage of a covenant she has no right to. See, at this point, it's not even legal for Jesus to meet this need the way she's approaching it. Now, remember I said the first account, didn't Mark's account, didn't tell us what she said. But over in Matthew, look again how she came. It said that she said, she came crying and she said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Now, that's the title for the Messiah. She's a Jew, but she's approaching him as Messiah. Now, if you'll allow me just a little bit of speculation here, there's a chance, there's an outside chance she didn't hardly know who the Messiah was. I mean, how's she going to know anything about the Messiah? She's a Syrophoenician woman, right? Probably she just heard somebody use the term and she parroted it, thinking, man, this would give me an in or something. You know, kind of like the seven sons of Sceva. You remember that story over in Acts 19? Where it said, you know, there were certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists that took upon themselves to call the name of Jesus over those who had devils. And they said, we adjure you by Jesus. You know, that one Paul preaches, you know. Well, they had no faith. They didn't have a covenant. They didn't have any faith. They're just going by hearsay. Now, that's possible. But even if she did understand the promise of the Messiah, again, I want you to understand, she's calling on someone she's got no legal right to approach. There is a covenant in the earth at this time. She's not a part of it. See, essentially, she's trying to make a withdrawal on somebody else's bank account. And Jesus can't do it. He flat said he can't. I'm not sent to you. He can't do it because it's outside his mandate. So he knows she's never going to get her need met if she stays with that approach. So Jesus ignores her. Now, really what this, I, I think this is a test. I really do. Again, he ignored her, but you have to see his heart. He knows this woman's barking up the wrong tree. Called her a dog, right? You, you, you missed that. <laughs> she's coming at it all wrong. She's trying to come like a Jew would come. But again, he's not sent to her. If she stays with that approach, she's never going to get anything. So he ignores her. But again, what's he trying to do? He knows she's not going to get it this way. So let's see if we can maneuver around here, get her to turn loose of that. And if we can get her to turn loose and come another way, maybe we can get this for her. I think he's trying to maneuver her, maneuver her into a position where she can receive. This is a test. And she's going to do one of two things with that silence. She's going to press in or she's going to get offended and leave. See, the silence here very much operated like the parables operated. You remember over there in Matthew 13 where Jesus talked about parables. He said some people hear a parable and they, they have a heart that causes them to press in to know the truth. Then there's other people who say, ah, too hard, and they walk off. She's got a choice to make. You, now, with, with parables, I like to say it this way. You've probably heard this said before. The same sun that melts wax hardens clay. Do you ever think of that? 
I mean, the same sun in the sky that will melt wax will harden clay. You take wax and put it in the sunlight, what happens? It becomes soft and pliable. You take the same sun on the same day, put clay beside it, and it hardens. The difference isn't the sun. The sun is constant. It's the material of what you put in there. Now, same thing with the parable. Same thing with this silence. She's either going to do like some folks and get hard and offended, and you can see how that could happen. Somebody just ignores you and walks off. Or she's going to have a heart that remains soft when God is silent. Hello? Have you ever been in a situation now, you haven't had Jesus in the flesh, to see him walk off. But you know, how many people do you suppose that have gotten offended at God and, and have walked away from what God really intended and wanted them to have, but they got offended at his silence. He's not answering on my timetable. What kind of a God is he? I'm telling you, that atheist website is full of them. But she wouldn't get offended. She didn't let that harden her she remains soft. And most importantly, you'll see this in a minute, she dropped the religion out of this real quick. And she changed her approach. You're going to see this in a moment. Let's keep reading. Let's pick this up in verse 25. It says, then she came and worshipped him. I mean, he's done everything to, 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 you know, I mean, she could have been offended, but she came and she worshipped him. You see her heart. And she worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. Now, there's a couple of things I see in this woman, and you can learn a lot just by looking at these things. The first thing I see about this woman, first of all, I said she stayed, stayed soft when she had the opportunity to get hard and get offended. She just stayed soft and, and trusted. Oh, I got to throw this in here. Uh, about a year ago, we're about a year out from when Dr. Hazel had had her accident. And, and we all remember what happened there. And, you know, I had a front row seat. I'd just come back to victory. I'm with Dr. George through a lot of this time. And one thing just touched my heart so much. It so impressed me. I mean, if you, it, there would have been, with, with some people, there would have been the opportunity to get offended. I mean, she's out there doing the work of God. You let this happen. You know what Dr. George said? And he said it repeatedly. He said, this isn't right. This isn't fair. But I trust you. Oh, what a heart. This isn't right. This isn't fair. But he stayed soft in the presence of something that could have made him hard. So I see that in this woman. She stayed soft. The second thing I see with her is persistent faith. Persistent faith. She just wouldn't quit. You know there's something about persistent faith that gets answers? There's something about persistence that gets answers. Sometimes people just quit too soon. This woman was persistent. But then I already said this before, she absolutely refused to be offended. I mean, call me what you want to call me, ignore me, say I'm irritating you. I don't understand all of that. I don't understand your silence, but I trust you. And again, she received. Now, I said she could have gotten offended. Let's keep reading. Let's pick this up again, verse 25. Is this helping you at all? Verse 25 says, then came she and, and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. And now here's the statement. Jesus answered and said, it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now let's talk about this dog thing. Now we know the father gave him the orders of what to say. So, you know, you know he's not trying to be rude. And you know it's not a racial slur. Really, he's speaking again in this cultural language. Again, this, this book that I told you about, Strange Scriptures that Perplex the Western Mind. It, it brings out this concept that Jewish unbelievers... We're known as pigs. You remember where Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, right? Jewish unbelievers were known as pigs. Gentile unbelievers were called dogs. Paul said, beware of dogs in Philippians. Now, you don't think he's talking about the four-footed barking kind. He's referring to, you got to be careful of Jewish unbelievers and Gentile unbelievers. Really, what he's talking about here is people outside the covenant. That's what he's trying to communicate she understood the lingo, and that's the message she got. Now, if you look at verse 27, here's where she switches. Remember I said, she's coming down the wrong road. She's trying to get this through the Jews' way. Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's bread, cast it to the Gentiles who I'm not sent to yet. Verse 27, she said, truth, Lord. Uh, yeah, I don't have a right to come that way. Yet even the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. What's she saying? I may be outside the covenant, but I can believe for a crumb. Now, at that point, I can just see Jesus start smiling. He says, he answered and said, it says here, O woman, great is thy faith. 
be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Now I want you to notice what that didn't say. It didn't say be it unto you even as God wills. Because clearly God hadn't sent him to the Gentiles yet. Listen, Jesus uh, was, was willing to make an exception. He actually stepped outside his commission to honor a woman's faith. You know God always honors faith? God always honors faith. Now, how does this apply to us? We've gone through the story. I've explained, you know, some of how this works. But how does it apply to us? Well, we've already given you a few things. We've already learned to stay soft, don't get offended, have bulldog faith. But I think the key thing we need to, as the takeaway, the key thing we need to get out of this today is found in verse 26. Look at it one more time. Jesus answered and said, it's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now notice what he called healing. He called healing the children's bread. Now in this case it was deliverance. In one sense it's, it's healing. One sense it's deliverance. But notice what he called healing and deliverance. He called it the children's bread. Now who does the children's bread belong to? Not a trick question. You can answer. The children. If you're saved... Healing belongs to you. Notice he called healing the children's bread. The children's bread belongs to the children. See, you have a place with God that this woman in the story didn't have. She's trying to come up on a covenant and take advantage of a covenant she's not a part of. But how many of you know that was the Jews' covenant? How many of you know we've got a better covenant established upon better promises? And if they could get healed under the old covenant, I want you to understand something. You can get healed under the new and healing is the children's bread. Notice he didn't call it the children's cake or the children's pie or the children's dessert. He called it the children's bread. Bread's a staple. You can have bread anytime you want to. If you have dessert anytime you want to, you wind up in trouble. We're working on some of that <laughs> at our house. But again, here's the thing. Again, you got to understand, healing's the children's bread. Now, sometimes people get so hung up on the thing, and I've been there, I know what it's like. And you're there, you're hurting, your body's hurting, and you're, you're wondering. And there's this nagging thing at the back, well, maybe it's not God's will for me. And, and you know the enemy of your soul is going to be in there saying, yeah, you're right, it's not for you. How can I know that it's God's will to heal me? Well, first of all, I just told you, healing's the children's bread. If you're a child of God, he said it belongs to you. Now, don't get hung up on the details right here. We're, we're just going to talk about the will of God. Remember, we talked about word skill and learning how to receive and all these different things. For now, let's set all that aside and why some don't get healed, why this and why that. Let's put that aside just for a moment. I just want to talk to you about the will of God. How can I know it's the will of God to heal me? Well, first, he called it the children's bread, and I'm a child, and it belongs to me. The second way I think we can understand and discern the will of God is just simply by looking at Jesus. Jesus was the will of God in action. How many would agree with that? Jesus was the will of God in action. Let me read you three quick verses. John 6, 38, you're not going to have time to get there. But John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. I didn't come to do my own will. So when he healed, whose will was he doing? The Father's. Hebrews 10, 7 says the same thing in other words. It says, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book is written to me, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He didn't come to do his own will. He came to do the will of the Father. And then John 14, 9 says, He that's seen me has seen the Father. See, Jesus and the Father are exactly alike. It's not like, you know, God's up here in heaven saying, Well, I don't know if I want to heal or not. And Jesus is kind of sneaking in behind quick while Dad's not looking. Zap. No, he came to do the will of the Father. That's, I mean, he said, I don't say anything but what I get it from him, and I don't do anything but what I get it from him. Jesus was the will of God in action. So I like to say it this way. Let this, Jesus used to say sometimes, let this saying sink down in your ears. I'm going to say that to you as well. Let this sink in your ears. I said Jesus was the will of God in action. I like to say it this way. The, the ministry of Jesus was a direct revelation of the will of God for all people, for all time. If Jesus was the will of God in action, then what he did was a direct revelation of the will of God for all people, for all time. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. So in closing, what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes and just look at Jesus. 
If he's the will of God in action, then who did he heal? Who did Jesus heal? Well, before we look at some scripture, let me ask you just a couple of real quick questions. As you've read through the Gospels, have you ever seen a time where Jesus even once said to a person, I'm sorry, but it's not my will to heal you? Even one time. No. Have you ever seen him say, well, the Father put this on you to teach you something? Not one time. Or have you ever seen him even say, it's not time yet. Come back in six months once you've learned. No, no. You never do see him do any of those things. Now I'm going to ask you a deep theological question. We stumped everybody in the first service with this one, but let's see if anybody can get it here. Old students, old, former students, you can't answer. But let me ask you a question. In order for an idea to be scriptural, what do you need? Might have heard it over here. Scripture. In order for an idea to be scriptural, you need scripture. If you have an idea built on an idea that, you know, I mean, well, yeah, but well, maybe he just, you know, it's never God, it's not God's will to heal. And well, listen, if there's no scripture for that, if you never see Jesus turn anybody away in scripture, if there's no scripture for it, then how can that be, how can that idea be scriptural? In order for an idea to be scriptural, you need scripture. So let's dig into scripture for a little bit and let's see who did Jesus heal. We've already discovered we never see him send anybody away. So who did he heal? I'm going to give you several scriptures here. We're not going to give you the... Well, let me give you quick references. Matthew 4, Matthew 9, Matthew 12. Matthew 4, 9, and 12. Then we're going to look at Matthew 14, and then 3 out of Luke. Luke 6, Luke 9, and Luke 4. If you want the references, email me. I'll give you the exact ones. But we're going to just read through this. I want you to see and just let the Word speak to you. Let's set all religious ideas aside and let's just see what the Bible says. Who did Jesus heal? I'm going to read several scriptures. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought, him, uh, sorry, they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, those that were possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Who was it to them? All sick people. Come down to the next one, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Next one, I like this. We're going to spend a little time here. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Now think about that for a minute. It said great multitudes. Now what I want you to do is I want you to picture in your head. Uh, we're not going to ask you exactly how many a multitude is, but what I want you to do, picture in your mind a multitude. Have you got the picture? Picture a multitude. Now, you're going to have to take that and expand it because he said, a great multitude. So take that multitude and, you know, expand that. Okay, now have you got that expanded? Now you're going to have to expand it even further because he said great multitudes. Uh. So you take a bunch of great multitudes, put them together. How many people is that? Heap of folks. Bunch of people. But it says great multitudes came and he healed them all. Didn't say to one of them, it's not my will. Going to have to hurry here. When the men of that place had knowledge of him, they went out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Another one says the whole multitude sought to touch him. There went power out of him and he healed them all. And the people when they knew him followed him and he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed all them that had need of healing. And then here's my favorite, Luke 440. And when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Who did Jesus heal? Oh. Now somebody might say, oh yeah, that was Jesus. Okay. Then what about the apostles? What about the disciples? Acts 28 8 says this. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius. How'd you like your name to be Publius? There landed, where we landed, there was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. 
And as it happened, Publius' father was ill with a fever and dysentery. And Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. Now watch this. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. Who did the apostles heal? All. Well, yeah, but that was the apostles. Well, you know, we couldn't expect to have that. I'm sorry, James doesn't agree with you. James 5, 14, he said, is any sick among you? Among who? The ones with a covenant, you and the church. He said, is any sick among you? Let the any sick call for the elders of the church and let them pray over the any sick, anointing the any sick with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the any sick and the Lord shall raise the any sick up. Who is healing for? any sick. I'm going to give you one more that came up in my heart. Yeah, you have your Bible with you. Go over. I hadn't planned to do this, but let's go over to Psalm 107. 107. This might be for somebody here because it just came up in my heart. We're going to take the time and be obedient. Look at this one. Now, you, you read through those scriptures about, you know, the Lord wants to heal, and we're trying to show you the heart of God, and he's a compassionate God, and he wants to heal. He, he hates to see suffering humanity. He'd rather see you well. But sometimes people think, well, yeah, but, but Pastor Ron, I don't deserve that, because you know what? Honestly, I, I did this to myself. I mean, I went out and I, I sowed my wild oats just like a lot of teenagers do. And I did this and I smoked this and I did all those things. And yeah, I'm suffering now, but you know, I just made my bed hard. I'm just going to have to lie in it. Has anybody ever thought like that? Well, let me show you a verse out of Psalm 107. Look at verse 20. This part's familiar. It said, he sent his word. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. You ever hear that verse before? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. I mean, that's shouting territory. Glory to God, he'll send his word and heal you. But, but stop and, and look at this for a minute. Remember I said sometimes people think, well, I, I've made my bed hard. I just got to lie in it. Look at this one more time. He sent his word and healed who? Them. You ever ask yourself, who's the them? Back up to verse 17 fools because of their sin, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Who's the them? The fools that sinned and got sick. Fools because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhors all manner of meat. They draw near to the gates of death. Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble, and he saves them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Who was the them he healed? The fools that sinned and got sick. And then he goes and says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Folks, I want you to understand something. We serve a good God. And even if you sinned and you're there this morning and you're, you're sick because of your sin, you know what? He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll put you back in right standing with himself and he'll heal you and make it as though you'd never sinned. And, and those consequences, he can even wash those away. Sometimes we've said, oh yeah, you know, Lord will forgive you, but there's still consequences. You know, we serve a God who can even release you from the consequences. Isn't he good? Last verse. I'm almost out of time. 2 Corinthians, let's go over there. 2 Corinthians 1. Is this helping you at all? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Give you a second to get there. We serve a good God. 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, for all the promises. How many of the promises? For a few of the promises. For some of the promises. Promises you try to believe for on Fridays. No. He says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, now let's dig into that for a little. It says, all the promises of God in him are yea. What does yea mean? Yes, that one's pretty easy. What does yay mean? It means yes. What does the word amen mean? Yeah, it does not mean over and out. It's not something God gave us that we put on the end of our prayer and we say, dear God, please do this in Jesus' name over and out. <laughs> no, it means so be it. Now look what it said. It said for all of the promises of God 
all of them, are yes and so be it. What does that mean? It means that if you could take a, a, a verse in the Bible and somehow transport yourself to heaven, whoop, and you're there in front of the throne room and you got your Bible. If you could walk into the throne room, point to a promise and say, God, is it your will to fulfill this in my life? The only answer you'd ever get back is yes, so be it. See, all the promises have already been pre-approved. It's like those things they kept sending me in the mail. From, you know, they want you to send up for yet, sign up for yet another credit card. And it says, you've already been pre-approved. What does that mean? They've already said yes. All they need me to do is you sign this, you know, you fill out this stuff, you send in, we've already said yes. I want you to understand something. God has taken all of the promises and stamped them yes. Now, this is a bit of a stretch. This is a pretty big crowd. Does anybody have uh, a message Bible on you real quick? Anybody real quick with the... Uh... Look it up sometime in the message Bible. I can't remember exactly how it says it, but it, it basically says that Jesus has already pre-approved it, used the word, and he's already stamped them yes, is, is how I, I believe that's stated. But what I want you to get, I want you to catch, if you've got a promise, you can have it. See, here's the, 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 the punchline out of everything we've said today. The woman with the, the, the Syrophoenician woman there, why didn't she, you know, why, why, what, what she was trying to do is she's trying to come and stand on a covenant she's not a part of, and she couldn't have it. But folks, I want you to understand something. You have a covenant with God. And healing is the children's bread. Healing belongs to you. Now, if we could just all stand, and if I could just get the worship team back up here, I just really felt this on my heart in the first service, so we're going to go do it in the second. What I want to do is I just want to give you an opportunity to act on the word. Now, we've already found out, the Bible said, you've already been pre-approved. So it's just a matter of, matter of coming to receive. So if you're here, and you've got a sickness in your body, maybe it's a little thing, maybe it's a big thing, whatever it is, but you've got something in your body that's not working right, and you want the Lord to minister to you right now, you want to receive a healing, just slip your hand up. Don't be shy. Yeah, all over the room. All right. Now, leave your hand up for just a second. What we're going to do is I want to agree together. Now, we're family here. This is our home church, but even if it wasn't our home church, listen, we're family. We belong to the family of God. We're all the children. Now, the good news that God wants you to know this morning is healing is the children's bread. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this a family affair. And if you're standing out there and your hand isn't up, but you're around somebody whose hand is up, slip your hands back up if you need healing. What I want you to do if you're, you're around someone is just slip out of the aisle and go put your hand on that person. The Bible says they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. These signs shall accompany those that believe. See, it didn't say these signs accompany preachers or the senior pastor or the original apostles, said these signs accompany those that believe. In my name, we talked about this here a while back, in my name they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now it didn't say it would be instant. Sometimes it is. Thank God for those times. But you know what? It did say you'll recover. So what we're going to do is we're going to release our faith together. And we're going to go stand on our covenant we have a covenant with God. So let's come before the Father right now as family. Father, in Jesus' name, right now in the name of Jesus, God, you see those with their hands up. And God, you know everything about them. You know intricately what's going on in each one of those bodies. Father, right now in Jesus' name, according to your word, according to Mark 16, 17, and 18, which says they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Father, according to that verse and according to the law of contact and transmission, Father, we lay our hands on these brethren, on these brothers and sisters. And right now in Jesus' name, we just release your healing power into them right now. In Jesus' name, Father, because of the covenant, because of the will of God, because of what's already been done on the cross, because of every Everything is being pre-approved. Right now in Jesus' name, we release the power of God and we speak to these sicknesses and we say, go in Jesus' name. And Father, in Jesus' name, we just release your healing power. Now, if you're there and your hands up and hands are on you, just relax. Don't, don't stress. 
just receive and just say thank you Jesus say that with me thank you Jesus for healing me God I believe that there's power flowing into me right now and in Jesus name I take hold of that power by faith and I believe I receive my healing in Jesus name now everybody agreed said amen, amen.